The Okanagan people from what is now the United States Northwest tell a story about Coyote. Once when Coyote was totally out of food, he went to visit Kingfisher and said, I'm hungry, what's to eat? Kingfisher didn't really want to feed Coyote, especially after such an abrupt greeting, but he had his son get three willow sticks and heat them in the fire. Then he bent them and tied them to his belt. He flew to the top of his lodge and from there swooped down to the river. It was frozen over, but he dived into a hole in the ice. When he came back up out of the hole, there was a fish on each willow stick. After eating, Coyote said that Kingfisher must come and eat with him the next day. Kingfisher tried to turn down the invitation, but when Coyote insisted, he agreed to come. So the next day, Kingfisher showed up, and Coyote asked his son to get three willow sticks and heat them in the fire. Then he bent them and put them on his belt and climbed to the roof of his lodge. His wife asked him what in the world he was doing, but Coyote said he'd often done this before. He was just getting food for Kingfisher. He jumped off the roof of the lodge down toward the river, but he missed the hole in the ice and broke his neck and was killed instantly. Kingfisher had been watching all this, and now he walked over to Coyote, took the three hooks from his belt, and jumped into the hole. A few moments later, he came up with fish. Then he stepped over Coyote four times, and Coyote came back to life. Coyote took the fish home to his wife and told her that he had caught them the way Kingfisher did. He added that Kingfisher was afraid of Coyote's power and had told him never to try fishing that way again, since Kingfisher was worried about how strong Coyote's medicine or power or magic was. The Coyote family had a good dinner that night. That's a trickster story that has many sides of Coyote in it. He tries to show off by doing something he can't do, and he gets killed. But then he recovers, and he gets the food, which is what he was really after in the first place, and he gets it without having to work for it. Then he brags to his wife about his strong medicine. The trickster is the most popular character in Native American myths. There are likely more stories about him than about anyone else. He isn't, of course, exclusive to North American tales. Many, us, many of us may have encountered him in characters like Till Eulenspiegel from German folk tales, or Reynard the Fox, a medieval European trickster, or even Mr. Toad of Toad Hall from Wind in the Willows. He also occurs in the myths of other cultures. He's Loki in Norse tales, Hermes in Greek myths, Anansi in West Africa, Susa Noo in Japan, Maui in Hawaii. But in most of these myths, he's a secondary character in a story about someone and something else. In North America, he frequently gets top billing. In most other parts of the world, with the partial exception of Africa, he's also more or less human, while in North America, he's either an animal or can take an animal form at will. He's rabbit in the southeast and some parts of the northeast. He's coyote on the plains and in the southwest. He's Iktomi the spider in parts of the plains. And in the northwest, he's raven, blue jay, or mink. Whatever shape he takes, he's always a lively character. Richard Erdos and Alfonso Ortiz, in their book, American Indian Trickster Tales, say this about him, quote, Of all the characters in myths and legends told round the world through the centuries, courageous heroes, scary monsters, rapturous virgins, it's the trickster who provides the real spark in the action. Always hungry for another meal, swiped from someone else's kitchen, always ready to lure someone else's wife into bed, always trying to get something for nothing, shifting shapes and even sex, getting caught in the act, ever scheming, never remorseful, end quote. Gerald Ramsey, in his book, Reading the Fire, adds that the trickster is always also full of energy, is impossible to kill, and is the perpetual enemy of domesticity, of growing up, of good citizenship, of modesty and faithfulness. Some of these qualities are on display in the Okanagan story we just looked at. But what's really striking about the trickster in Native American myths is that he's also a culture hero, one of those who helps to finish off the work of creation and helps to establish the skills and materials and institutions and ceremonies and traditions that allow a people to survive. <laughs> 
He always has special powers or strong medicine, as it's often called. He steals fire and gives it to people. He tames the sun into its 24-hour circuit. He creates rivers and streams and stocks them with fish. And he kills monsters. And all of this is managed by a buffoon, a clown, someone who half the time winds up dead or in a pile of manure because he was too clever by half. It's this combination of seemingly incompatible qualities that makes the trickster such an interesting and intriguing character. Prometheus steals fire in Greek myths, but he's certainly not a clown, at least not in Aeschylus's play Prometheus Bound. But in Native American stories, the same character who steals fire and gives it to humans eats too many of the wrong kind of berries, then passes wind so violently that he has to hang on to something to keep from getting blown up into the sky, who then defecates so abundantly that he has to climb a tree to keep above the growing pile, who then of course loses his hold on the tree and falls into it, and next, blinded by his own dung, he bangs into trees all the way to the river into which he jumps in to try to wash himself clean. It's an amazing combination. Quite a few of the culture heroes we've already met are in fact also tricksters. Raven's brother, the one who gets himself reborn as Raven's son and then puts the sun back in the sky, is such a figure for the Inuit. Nanabushu of the Ojibwa is as much a trickster as a culture hero. For the Crow people, Coyote is a full-scale trickster, but he also creates much of the world. And Iktomi, the Sioux trickster, is responsible both for good and for ill for the way the world turned out. The Nez Perce Coyote brings death into the world by being his usual impulsive self. And the Navajo Coyote messes up what would have been an orderly pattern of the stars, and he changes the world a lot in his pursuit of Bear Woman. Even the Hopi had a a trickster, although he was a fairly grim one. Masawa, like the other tricksters, can change shape and switch back and forth from human to animal. And like the others, he's eager to find a way to get a maiden into his blanket. What makes Masawa seem a little less like a trickster in relation to those of other peoples is that he lives so austerely and is also the lord of death. But there are enough stories of him as lecher, thief, and liar that he is a member of the club even though he may be its most solemn member. One explanation for this odd combination of culture hero and rogue and fool is that whatever the trickster accomplishes as a culture hero, whether for good or ill, isn't a result of wanting to help or harm humans. What he does, he does for personal reasons, because that's who he is. That's the kind of thing he would do. He never has any great overarching plan or any kind of blueprint to guide him. He just does what comes to mind, what strikes him as interesting or fun or useful for his purposes at that moment. Claude Lévi-Strauss, the French anthropologist, calls him a bricolure, that is, a fix-it person, a tinker, who takes whatever materials are available and patches them together in whatever ways strike him at that moment. His motives are always personal and his plans ad hoc. Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Sometimes others benefit from what he does and sometimes they're harmed. His stories can be and often are funny, but the fun is partly serious because much of what he does has consequences for us and consequences at that that weren't planned out or anticipated by the trickster when he did whatever it was that he did. Most often, his actions are motivated by his two great hungers for food and sex. More than one trickster appears with a penis so large that it has to be carried in a box, and intestines so big that they have to be wrapped around his body, great symbols for his two great appetites. As to why Native American tricksters should so often be animals or appear as animals when they wish, We've noticed that Native American attitudes about the relationship between animals and humans were very different from those of the Old World. The same is true of attitudes in Africa, the other place where the trickster is most often associated with an animal. Native Americans thought that animals are a lot more like us than we do, that they have minds and wills and counsels, that they have to be dealt with in more or less the same ways we deal with each other. The gap between humans and animals for them wasn't such a large one. 
And it's why in so many stories, characters can slide back and forth from human to animal or vice versa. Also, most trickster tales occur in mythic times, before there were people or just after people have arrived. And most Native Americans believed that back then, there was even less difference between animals and humans than there is now, so they could change their appearance at will. Levi Strauss has argued that the trickster occupies a mediating position between extremes or mutually incompatible positions. One of the ways that works is in seeing the trickster as a mediator between animal and human, finding a way easily to fit into either role and moving back and forth between them. We might also ask why particular animals turn up as tricksters in Native American stories. Coyote, raven, rabbit, mink, blue jay, spider. All trickster animals, according to Michael P. Carroll, in an article about tricksters entitled The Trickster as Selfish Buffoon and Culture Hero, are loners, he says, the opposite of gregarious. This is especially true of the coyote and the spider. A spider spends only two brief times in its lifetime in the company of other spiders, at birth and in mating. Zoologists tell us that coyotes used to run in packs like wolves, but they adapted by becoming solitary hunters who are much more successful working alone than together. The coyote is also swift and crafty and eats almost anything. One of its tricks is to pretend to be dead in order to lure scavengers, which it then kills and eats. There are in fact a lot of stories about coyote as trickster in which he uses just this ploy to get something he wants. In one Navajo story, Coyote pretends to have drowned in a flash flood and washed up in the middle of a prairie dog colony. He even uses seeds to make it look like he's covered with maggots. The prairie dogs invite ground squirrels and rabbits and other small prey animals to hold a great dance over his body, at which point he jumps up and kills enough of them for a good meal. We can understand why a trickster needs cunning. It's his stock in trade, his way of surviving in the world. But he also needs to be a loner because the trickster is never really a part of a community, even if it sometimes happens that he marries and has children and lives in a village. He's always an outsider on the road, living outside the laws and rules and structures that bind the rest of us. Lewis Hyde, in his excellent book on tricksters called Trickster Makes This World, describes the trickster this way, quote, All tricksters are on the road. They are lords of in-between. A trickster does not live near the hearth. He does not live in the halls of justice, the soldier's tent, the shaman's hut, the monastery. He passes through each of these when there is a moment of silence, and he enlivens each with mischief, but he is not their guiding spirit. He is the spirit of the doorway leading out and of the crossroad at the edge of town, the one where a little market springs up. He is the spirit of the road at dusk, the one that runs from one town to another and belongs to neither." End quote. Physically, the trickster lives outside community, outside the village, the family, the clan, the nation. But he also lives outside the moral and ethical boundaries that define a culture. He gets around eventually to defying every rule, breaking every taboo, challenging every customary way of doing things. He sleeps with his daughters and his mother and his mother-in-law. He kills his relatives. He chooses his bride from out of the menstrual lodge where women are supposed to be absolutely sequestered, a huge taboo. He commits adultery whenever he can. He steals, he lies, he cheats. And when it's time for a reckoning, he's already on the road again, out of town. He never stays around to take responsibility for anything he does. But still, in spite of all this, he's sacred. He's semi-divine. He's a culture hero, and Native Americans told his stories to each other and to their children with obvious relish. We've been talking mostly about coyote, but what's true for coyote is true for other tricksters as well. Raven was the trickster of the Inuit and the Northwestern peoples. For agricultural peoples, ravens can be nuisances, pests. But neither the Inuit nor the Northwestern fisherfolk were farmers, 
so they could appreciate the bird's intelligence, its seeming sense of humor, and fun, and its look of wisdom. Rabbit, with his busy, busy sexual life, made good trickster material, and the spider could trap its prey in complicated webs spun from its own body. All of them seem capable of devious behavior, which is a great asset for a trickster. A lot of trickster stories are told just for fun, like the one about Rabbit told by the Hachidi, who lived in what's now Georgia in southeast United States. In this one, Rabbit has his eye on two pretty daughters of an old man who raises pigs. The old man complains that his pigs are disappearing. One day, Rabbit cold calls the old man, who finds Rabbit holding on to a pig's tail, the rest of the pig seemingly having disappeared into the ground. The old man says he'll hold the tail while Rabbit goes to get a hoe and a shovel to dig out the pig. Instead, Rabbit goes to the house and tells the young girls that their father had told him to make love to both of them. They say they aren't sure they could believe him, so he calls out to the farmer, who's still holding on to that pig's tail, Did you say both? The old man hollers back, Yes, I said both! Of course, he's talking about the hoe and shovel, not his daughters, but the daughters are convinced and do the obedient thing. After a while, the old man gets bored holding on to the pig's tail, so he gives it a tug to see what will happen. He winds up with a pig's tail in his hand, since that's all there ever was of that pig, its tail buried just enough to make it look as though the pig were making its way into the ground. By the time he gets to the house, Rabbit has finished with the daughters and is long gone. The old man is angry, and he promises serious punishment if he can ever catch Rabbit. Now that story's provenance may be European. The pigs seem unusual for Native American story, but Southeastern peoples did try to emulate European farming techniques, so maybe they tried some pig raising too. Anyway, even if the story came from somewhere else, the Hichidi told it and it was collected from them, and it nicely illustrates the trickster's character and mode of operation. In many stories like this, he winds up being not quite clever enough, or sometimes he overcomplicates his trick and winds up getting hoist with his own patar. But in this one, he gets the better of the old farmer and his daughters and gets what he wants without going about it in the usual way. But if some trickster stories were told just for fun, others negotiate that tricky combination of trickster and culture hero. A very famous one is about Raven stealing the sun. This one is from the Haida, who live on islands off the coast of British Columbia and Alaska. In the mythic age, Raven blundered around in the total darkness of Earth. It was so dark that it was hard to get around, let alone find food, since all the light in the world was held by a man who lived in a house by a river with his daughter. Where exactly the house was, or what kind of being he was, the story doesn't say. Eventually, Raven stumbled upon the house where the man and his daughter lived, and he decided to try to steal the light. The first difficulty was that he couldn't find the house's door. There didn't seem to be one, and whenever Raven waited on one side of the house for the people to come out, they'd exit out the other side. So he'd wait on that side the next time, and then they'd emerge from another door on some other side. Remember that this all happened in total darkness. So he watched to see where the daughter went when she left the house, and he discovered that every day she went to the river for water. So he waited for her there. One day he decided what to do. He changed himself into a tiny hemlock, hemlock needle. He put himself in the water, and he floated into the waterproof basket she was filling. Next, he had to make sure that she was the one who swallowed the needle. He managed that, and after a time, the daughter inexplicably found herself pregnant. It was totally dark inside the house, too, so the father wasn't aware of his daughter's pregnancy until there was suddenly a baby in the house, his grandchild. The baby, we're told, was kind of odd-looking, with a long nose that looked a lot like a beak and the occasional feather here and there. But of course, it was still dark, so no one could see the baby anyway. The grandfather became very fond of the child, and he indulged him in every way except for letting him play with a series of boxes in which the light was kept. But once the baby found out that he couldn't have that, that stack of boxes was the only thing he wanted. 
He cried all day, his voice sounding, we're told, like a combination of all the noises of a spoiled child and that of an angry raven. The outermost in the series of boxes was the largest, and the innermost one was very small, but only the innermost one contained the light. So after putting up with the baby's complaints for a long time, the grandfather finally consented to let him play with the outermost box. Then, after a time, he let the baby play with the next one and the next one, until there were only a few small boxes left, at which point a strange radiance began to fill the house. Then the baby begged to be able to play with the light itself. Again, after a time, the grandfather gave in. He took a shining ball from the smallest box and tossed it to his grandson. At once, the baby changed into a raven and flew out through the smoke hole, holding in his beak the brilliant light. The world was instantly transformed as light poured over it for the first time. In one ending to this story, Raven was attacked while he was flying by by an eagle, an eagle who for the first time could actually see what he was hunting. In dodging the eagle, Raven dropped half of the light he was carrying, and when it hit the ground, it shattered into one large piece and many small ones. They bounced up into the sky to become the moon and stars. When Raven let go of the last piece, out beyond the rim of the world, it floated up into the sky to become our sun. In a different version of the story, a Tlingit one from the northwest coast of northern British Columbia, Alaska, and the Yukon Territory, Raven brought the light still in its box to a river where people, people were fishing in the dark. There he was annoyed by all the noise they were making, and he wanted them to be less noisy, or, he said, he would release the light. He let some of it fall on them, and they made still more noise, partly from astonishment and partly because they were afraid of the light. So Raven released all of it, and the terrified people ran helter-skelter to try to get away from it. As they ran, they turned into various kinds of animals, seals, bears, and birds. Raven then sent Chicken Hawk out to sea to fetch fire and bring it back to the remaining people. He also told them that some animals would always be their friends, especially since quite a few of the animals had formerly been human. Raven is clearly a culture hero in these stories. He brings both light and fire to the people, and along the way, he helps to create some useful animals. But it's important to notice that he doesn't do any of this as a favor to people. He does it because he's tired of bumping around in the dark, and he's annoyed by all the noise people make when he brings the light. His motives are purely personal. There are consequences, some of which are useful to people, but Raven isn't working from any kind of plan or grand scheme. He just does stuff, and then other stuff happens, some good and some bad. Frequently, the trickster is the one who brings death into the world. We've seen how Nanabushu and Coyote and Masawa have done this for the Ojibwa, the Nez Perce, and the Hopi. And there are many other such stories. But if the trickster sometimes does good things for people without actually intending it, so he sometimes does bad things too. The tricksters who bring death to humans mostly don't really intend to. It just happens as a result of something the trickster has done on a whim or for some personal reason. So, what can we make of this amazing and complicated character? I've already mentioned Claude Lévy-Strauss, who sees the trickster as a mediator, occupying a place between two poles, making him necessarily an ambiguous character. What he does is to hold together extreme or even mutually incompatible positions to keep them from flying apart or canceling each other out. In a way, he allows us to have our cake and to eat it too. He, in fact, mediates many things. The trickster always stands halfway between culture and nature in that he can play roles in a village, father, husband, chief, medicine man, but then he could leave the village and revert to being a natural creature in a natural environment. He can do this in part because he's an animal or can switch back and forth between being human and being animal and thus has two entirely different kinds of behavior available. We still don't find it comfortable all the time to live simultaneously in society and in nature, 
But for Native Americans, the issue was even more complicated than it is for us because they still lived so much closer to the natural world than we do. Insofar as the trickster is partly childlike, he can mediate between the way we were and the way we are now. When we were children, we were fixated at oral and anal stages, as the trickster still is. And we behaved in ways that from a grown-up point of view were primitive and uncouth. Both as individuals and as a society, we've grown up since then. And we can now measure how far we've come in watching children and in telling trickster tales. The trickster is also a mediator between the demands of the community and the demands of the self. As we've noticed, virtually all Native American cultures were group-oriented. Their ethical and behavioral rules always favored the group over the individual. The individual's impulses had to be suppressed for the good of the clan. This wasn't an arbitrary choice. Survival frequently depended on the group sticking together and caring more for the corporate body than the individual one. When Native Americans listened to the trickster tales, they could see that his irresponsibility and selfishness usually gets him into trouble. And his humiliation and embarrassment reaffirmed the rules by which they lived. In laughing at what happens to him for breaking the rules, the importance of those rules can be reinforced. And to some extent, this is true of all cultures in all times and places. Society always works for the greatest good of the greatest number, but it can do this only if individuals restrain some of their impulses for the good of others. We'd perhaps like to cheat or steal or commit adultery or lie or do whatever we want, but we know that to do these things would tear the social fabric apart. Trickster stories reminded Native Americans of these truths too. Because tricksters are characters who don't obey the rules, who violate all the taboos from incest to cannibalism, who never put the social order ahead of their own needs and desires. Insofar as they're like that, their stories remind us how important our prohibitions are, why we have to have them. But at the same time, they also give us a temporary vacation from them, if only a vicarious one. The embarrassments and punishments earned by tricksters in the stories make us feel better about the way we have to live. But we can also, for a few minutes, until the boom gets lowered on coyote or rabbit or raven, feel what it must be like to do what we want, not what we have to. It's a temporary release from our normal duties and selves. That's what Sigmund Freud concluded in his work on the discontents of civilization. Civilization, he said, always demands the curtailment of our primitive and infantile energies. We learn to curb them to make it possible for us to live together. Freud was thinking primarily of sexual energy, but sex can be a metaphor for all the things we want to have and do. And it works particularly well with the trickster, since sex is one of the things he always wants, and he's willing to break all the rules to get what he's after. The trickster can mediate between our infantile impulses and the restraints civilization imposes on them because he's both childlike in his pursuit of his own pleasure and a culture hero, one who makes civilization possible, a bringer of culture and civilization. It's another way in which trickster stories allowed Native Americans to have their cake and eat it too. The other thing that I think the trickster did for the Native Americans was to remind them that the world isn't perfect. Sometimes the trickster gets punished for his misdeeds, but sometimes he doesn't. And he pretty much always enjoys what he gets with his tricks, whether it's a good meal or a night in bed with someone else's wife. He enjoys it whether he gets caught or not. Trickster stories aren't always moral. Sometimes he can outwit a giant or a monster, giving us hope that sometimes the weak can overcome the strong, but it doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes the giant kills the trickster, because that happens in the world too. For Native Americans, the world was a good place, but it wasn't perfect. How could it be cobbled together as it was, at least in part, by a trickster? And that this is so was another reminder to stay disciplined, to maintain loyalty to the clan, to do the right thing. The trickster was seen at the heart of everything so that it made sense that the world in which Native Americans lived was sometimes imperfect, 
sometimes illogical, sometimes unfair. As Gerald Ramsey put it, puts it in his book, Reading the Fire, whose comments on the trickster I've been following here, Native Americans knew all of this about their world and still found it pretty good, considering. Good enough, anyway. It's a world. Our world. The trickster taught people a lot and gave people a lot, but he didn't finish things properly. Much of what he did was foolish, and he was selfish, vain, boastful. Native Americans always knew that trickster was out there, on the road somewhere, going somewhere, getting away with something, not getting away with something, getting humiliated, getting killed, while at the same time always partly defining, actually creating the world in which they lived. In all of these ways, the trickster did a lot of work in Native American myths, and he allowed Native Americans to embrace the world with all of its faults as well as all of its opportunities.